Well, hello. Thank you for joining us. It's just two o'clock. We're here for our latest installation in the pandemic and policy practice and politics seminar series that we've started here in, in EPS. And today we're going to have my incoming Associate Dean for Graduate Education. He'll have that new title as of January 1, but we have Dr. Do Young Kim, who's going to talk to us today, uh, who is not wearing a mask and why? Implications for a mask mandate in response to COVID-19. So I'm really excited to hear this, uh, you know, t absolutely salient and timely topic. So Dr. Kim. Thank you for, uh the opportunity to share one of my recent research work on COVID-19. Um, so since March, I've done uh, multiple projects on COVID-19, and but I'm particularly interested in this work on face mask because <clears throat> it actually relates to so many different subjects and aspects, not only just science and medicine, but also culture, politics, economics, and also it has a lot of interest in global comparison. So now I'm, I'm sure that you agree that mask wearing is a part of our everyday lives, but it was not that true back in spring. So I think I should begin my presentation today by sharing my personal story on masks. So back in February and March, when we had only a hundred of cases, and when my wife asked, do we need to wear a mask? And I said, we don't need to because it was what exactly CDC and WHO suggested. But later on, they changed their recommendation. Now we know that's very silly and sort of uh, not scientific recommendation. So my wife keeps saying that, how can you provide the wrong advice as a global health experts? But it was not just me, everyone was unclear uneducated and misguided back then. But I think now it seems pretty clear, at least among the scientific communities, and mask wearing is really key to control the current pandemic. However, uh, we actually need to overcome more challenging barriers to improve the role of mask wearing to control the current pandemic. So during the next about 30 minutes, I will talk about some data and the current status of, of, of the mask wearing in the United States and also uh, sort of global uh, status and uh, share my current research, how my research try to address some, some of those concerns, at least partly. So please feel free to uh, ask any question about uh, my presentation because I think this time everyone is kind of experts on, on COVID-19 and also how we can address this problem. So I welcome your suggestion and also feedback at the end of the presentation. Uh, that will be a really big help for my uh, research and publication. Okay, let me move on to... Right, so recently we got very interesting, exciting news about vaccination. So uh, I also see some positive and uh, pretty optimistic future, at least probably middle of next year. But unfortunately, even with vaccines um, coming soon, but we must still wear a mask. And there are so many articles out there and why we need to still wear a mask even after the vaccination arrived because of so many different reasons. Of course, it takes so much time to get everyone vaccinated to reach out to a certain level of herd immunity, but also vaccination is not perfect. Uh, although some pharmaceutical company claim that their effectiveness is close to 95%, 90%, but uh, it really depends how you calculate. So. Uh, vaccination may not be uh, so perfectly effective, but also duration. It may, uh, we haven't have enough data or evidence about uh, clear duration. It may stay only for a, a, a year or so, then people get reinfected, even if they get, got immunized. So probably, of course, the multiple vaccination or annual vaccination may help, but a lot of things are still up in the air is unclear. 
So um, mask use is a, a good teammate of the social distancing, as we all know. Um, so ideally, the mask use and social distancing should be a, a teamed up uh, to uh, really reduce, almost eliminate uh, any potential risk of uh, contracting each other. So, um, so we probably think that these two can be uh, can work as a complement to each other, but but looks like they are sort of the substitutes each other. What's happening right now? So um, if they wear a mask, they may not uh, uh, be willing to do a lot of uh, comply with social distancing because they feel that they are a little protected. But uh, if they really try to uh, follow very strong social distancing, then probably they don't need to wear a mask and very uh, strictly. So it may um, work as a substitute to each other. And this is uh, really true and uh, according to the data. Um, then if we need to choose only one out of these two options, which is easier, which is actually more effective and more better. Of course, it depends, but um, we can actually see that um, social distancing may be a little more uh, difficult in the uh, economic sense. So we all know that the, if we push more strongly on the social distancing or lockdown or stay at home order, then there's always concern about the economy. And uh, this is a really kind of risk risk dilemma on social distancing. But the mask is not, uh, at least does not have that kind of concern on the uh, economy because it's more like a personal. But the mask use has a, very strong cultural connotation here when you look at the um, sort of global um, sort of coverage of mask wearing across different continents. So this is a back in July. This changed uh, a little bit, but still stayed uh, pretty similar. So as you all know, East Asia, um, very high the coverage of the mask wearing and close to 90%. And this isn't really true even in like in February and March. So that's the one of the reason they maintain their cases and death and as low as possible compared to the other continents. So even within the same continents in like Europe, there are some country um, are pretty good job in, 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 in improving their mass coverage up to 80%, but some countries still pretty low. And US is getting better and back in, as I said, back in February, and March, almost no one wear a mask, but uh, like things are getting worse and worse. And then people now uh, have realized the importance of the mask wearing and now getting close to about 70%. So even with this like big pandemic is getting worse and worse, but still about 30% still not wearing a mask. As I said, um, the mask wearing it doesn't um, have a big impact on their economic sort of the lifestyle or their daily lives and their work, but it has a, a pretty strong cultural aspects or political aspects. So I'm sure that you've seen this kind of cartoon a lot and the really showing how the Western people, Americans or European people, have some kind of the stigma or prejudice on the people with masks, right? Because this has a, some kind of cultural connotations or some historic kind of um, sort of the image of the wearing a mask. But things have changed and this type of the stigma has been has been uh, uh, substantially declined. But uh, recently on a related to the kind of the just uh, recent election, it has also a very strong political sort of message uh, in terms of the wearing a mask and or support for a mask mandates. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about this, but um, I think this political aspects or polarization on in terms of the perception of mask is not explaining everything about why people uh, don't wear a mask or who uh, don't wear a mask. So we'll get into more details about what's happening in this um, sort of issue. 
And let's let's take a look at the some global um, sort of impact of mask wearing. And this is also uh, sort of uh, sometime in uh, March and April data. So when you look at the uh, sort of two different groups, the 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 group of countries where masks are strongly advised, mostly in East Asia and uh, South Korea, Japan and Singapore and Hong Kong, they uh, were able to maintain the sort of the the curve pretty um, pretty well. And compared to the countries where the masks were not advised, uh, UK, Germany and USA. So this is a clear sort of the evidence that mask worked well in maintaining uh, the case is low and it is very important to maintain the cases in the really earlier stage of uh, of the pandemic. So ironically uh, that really um, sort of strong mandates or compliance on mask wearing allow the people in those country to less stringent on the social distancing. So this graph actually show you and the mask wearing and social distancing is totally substitute each other. So uh, if you look at the graph here on the like sort of right hand side in South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So most of the the um, the East Asian countries or countries with a very strong uh, mask uh, wearing policy or recommendation, they were able to um, social distancing less because they, they, they these two can sort of the work as a as a as a substitutes. So uh, that really related to the the impacts on the economy and job loss and the other type of the uh, social kind of the daily lives. So this clearly uh, give us a message about the um, so these two needs to be combined as a as a, a perfect match, but that was not happening. Um, these days. And what about the state level um, evidences of the uh, mask wearing on uh, on the the controlling the cases? So this is also the June data, but there's a clear negative relationship between the mask wearing coverage and the the rate of COVID-19 reproduction. So New York and California back then, but it's changing a lot. But um, so the the more they the, the stronger they uh, put the mask mandate or recommendation, they're the more likely that they control the the cases or or lower the reproduction rates. Okay, then uh, let's start with the good news first. So compared to back in April and now. The mask wearing is getting better and better. That's good. It's a partly because partly because of the the awareness of the risks and also also partly because of the the strong uh, strong regulation of each states or each local governments. So back in April 20th, uh, if you look at the United States and then very little less than I think uh, it kind of vary a little bit, but most of the states are around 10 to 40 percent mask wearing um, coverage compared to the Asia or South America and then almost close to 70 percent even even that time. But but this is only a few weeks ago and now the US is getting close to the other uh, comparable countries now getting close to 70 percent, even 75 percent depending on the where where they live. But that's not enough, at least according to the science and the scientific the literature, that's not enough. So of course, it's not just about the how many people wear a mask, but also how effective the mask uh, itself. So, um, so depending on like how well you wear a mask and what kind of mask you, you wear, and it also um, actually is influencing the actual outcome. But as long as you wear a mask correctly and the, the sort of effective mask, then uh, to have to really reach out to the, the blue area where the COVID-19 spread can be stopped sufficiently, then the, their sort of the ideal 
rates of mask wearing is uh, close to 90% or 95%. So that's what they're really trying to achieve to, uh, to sort of really uh, control the pandemic by using a mask wearing as a policy tool. But the question is, can we really achieve it? Uh, if it is possible, if, if so, then what can, what can we do? What should we do? And if you look at the temporal patterns of their mask research in the United States since March, then um, so there is a big jump around in April and May, and that's where we actually had um, the second wave as well as when we reopened the economy. So people, when they need to return the return back to their work and they need to wear a mask, right? So there, there is a big jump uh, one time. But after that, there's another jump on over the summer and July and August. That's also understood. And and when when they had a uh, like another big uh, sort of the outbreak, mostly in the south and Texas and California, so it increased a little bit. But after that, people are uh, seem to be exhausted and tired, and and so it it really stuck at that level, like sixty percent and seventy percent. But uh, as you see in this graph, and they really try to reach out to 90, even 95% coverage as a universal mask use targets. Then all the projections of COVID-19, what's going to happen in next month or maybe next March, it all depends on how much they really comply with this mask coverage, how much the, each country can achieve the mask wearing rates. So if you really look at the other country like South Korea, my home country, and Actually, um, the mask wearing uh, the coverage rate is now 92% and very close to 95% uh, goal. But even that 3% gap is not enough. So recently, South Korea also had a kind of big outbreak and compared to the few few weeks ago. So that really indicate that even the 3% kind of gap below the, their target is it can make uh, bad things happen. It, it can happen almost everywhere. But in the United States, still way below the 95% target, then how can we really move the 70% rate up to 90%, 95%? And whether this possible or not, that's a part of my question. If you look at the spatial patterns of mask wearing, um, in the United States, and this is a little outdated July, so it has been improved, but not much. And there is a clearly a spatial distribution and some states, some part of the area because of the population density or or maybe some their lifestyle and um, their mobility patterns. So it is kind of understood, but you see the clear patterns and, and depending on on their lifestyle and, and urbanity. But also partly because of the policy, this is actually the role of policy. Um, some states, um, depending on the actual risk they uh, they are aware of, or also their sort of the the belief about the science, belief about the role of the mask. And some state, uh, this is as of actually the few weeks ago, November 19th, and some states still uh, have not uh, had the mask mandates in effect and and. Of course, Texas, uh, the mask mandate rule, and it's in public places and in the in the shop and and um, some public places they need to wear a mask. But there are still some states about uh, I think one third of the states are not in effect yet. OK, then now back to the the my main question in my research, who wear a mask and why? And of course, uh, in the past few months, there are so many papers out there. So I'm sure that if you work on the COVID-19 study and you've seen a lot of papers out there. And so uh, what's already known clearly uh, is some demographic information really uh, influence their mask wearing preference and behaviors. Like for example, female are more, like, more likely to wear and Democrats are more likely to wear than Republicans, and also the more educated, they are more likely to wear a mask. And why they wear a mask? And the three quarters of people who wear a mask 
said that the mat they believe that mass protects others and and themselves that's why they uh, that's the main reason they wear a mask and only six percent said that they uh, uh, it's just required no matter whether they believe or 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 not uh, the the effectiveness of mask but they are supposed to wear a mask at work or at a certain places so um this is a uh, of course informative but we believe that this is a uh, too simplistic so we need to get into in more detail sort of the um, the aspects of the mask wearing uh, in order to achieve the 90%, 95% goal. And what makes this case more complex and challenging? Because there are so many uh, different sort of the value conflicts. So like I'll call the risk versus risk trade-off or, or conflict of the different values. So um, I, even if we kind of agree that the fast uh, face covering is still the most effective and low cost interventions, but, um, but of course in a certain country like United States or some European countries and they, uh, some people love freedom even then, uh, then, then public safety. But also people, some group of people really uh, prioritize economic sort of um, growth better than health risks. But also some people simply enjoy the, uh, willing to enjoy the political rights and compared to a kind of strong government control. They simply hate the uh, government to should say something about their personal lives. So with all those challenging and conflicting values in, in this situation, how can the US policy or even some other countries can achieve such a complex but very important public policy, health policy goal? Uh, that's the question of my research. And I think the, the more detailed classification may help because as I said, the simple classification, OK, this person wear a mask because of this. This person don't wear a mask because of this. Then maybe too simplistic may not be helpful to solve the problem. But there are so many people already out there try to so, try to classify people based on their mask wearing. And in these two cartoons, and you see how they can be classified depending on their perception, attitude and behaviors on mask wearing and also their uh, whether they really comply with the government's order. So something similar to this, but the academically we try to uh, classify the people based on the their perception, behavior and attitude uh, toward the mask wearing. So I would say the more fruitful policy discussion recognize those who believe the government should require face masks should be distinct from those who are wearing them. Okay, because some people may still wear a mask even if they don't believe the effects of mask or even if they believe that uh, the government should not enforce any mask mandates. They simply wear a mask. So we need to get into more detailed reasons and also the, the different factors behind their their perception behind their choice of wearing masks. So if you are able to understand this complex complexity, then we may raise a face mask usage sufficiently. Not may not be that like high 90%, 95%, but at least we can sort of overcome the current threshold like 70%, get up to the 80% or 85, then that will be a big help in controlling and current pandemic. So this is a collaborative work with the UC San Diego, Berkeley and Arjuna State and then Chapel Hill and currently under review by science. Uh, we will keep, keep trying so uh, your feedback will be very much appreciated. So our classification is a, a, a little more complex. We actually use uh, two different questions uh, about mask wearing, whether they really wear a mask and how they believe uh, in terms of the effective, effectiveness of mask and, and related to the uh, government mandates. 
So uh, in our classification, there are four groups. The first group believe the mandating the mask, face mask is, is necessary and they wear a face mask. So it's a good match between their perception and, and their behavior. So we call them as believers. But the last group, the group D, also match between their behavior and perception. They don't believe face mask regulation is legitimate, and also they don't wear a mask. So they're enlist um, consistence, right? So we call that, them as a defiers. Well, what's uh, interesting uh, here in this classification is the, the second and third group. So there is a, a certain mismatch between their perception and behavior. So first, the group B, we call compliance disbelievers. They wear a mask, even though they don't believe in mandatory masking. But group C is totally opposite. As non-compliant believers, they support regulation, but don't wear a mask. Very interesting sort of mismatch. So really try to understand who they are and why they chose that kind of the behavior in combination of their, their perception. So that will raise important question of promoting the face mask usage. And we can sort of quantify bounds on what might be achieved with mask with a certain level of policy. Okay, we use the YouGov Internet Panel Survey data, which is the nationally representative sample of 2000 respondents. And uh, the questionnaire uh, that was designed by our team and the survey was conducted in late August and early September. As mentioned, we actually, this questionnaire itself is uh, almost more than 15 pages, but we include a few questions about face masks and we use the, these two questions. Suppose or oppose, if a local city or county government was considering a regulation that would require everyone to wear a face mask outside their home. And also we ask whether they really wear or not a face mask when you go outside your home since COVID-19 began. And of course, we were able to control a lot of other COVID-19 from the, from the survey, such as social demographic characteristics, economic situation, and whether their families or somebody they know uh, uh, have a COVID-19 or die of COVID-19, health status, and some knowledge about COVID-19 or some related issues, and then their political views and so on. So this is what we got. So this table one shows how many belong to each group. So this is something similar to what uh, we saw in the graph. So 60% belong to group A. So uh, they're a believer, right? They wear a mask and also support for a mask regulation. And group B, they wear a mask, but they oppose mask regulation. So combining these two, about 77%, that's kind of very close to what we saw in the graph, about 75%. That's the current rates of mask wearing. And group D, this is a um, defier. So they don't believe in mask wearing and also they strongly oppose the any type of mask mandates, the 13%. So we think that this is kind of the, the very strong threshold or maybe maximum uh, rate that we can achieve without very strong, very stringent and divisive enforcement of the mandates. So uh, we cannot reach as, as, as high as 95% or 93% like in some country in, in, in East Asia, but at least we can reach out to 85 or up to 90% based on this result. So what's important in here in this table and we really need to look at these two groups, group B and C, try to maintain the existing compliance from group B and try to shift the people in group C from non-compliance into the group of compliance. That's the goal of um, this study. 
And of course, we don't have the clear answer how to, but uh, at least we can show that um, who they are and how we can classify them based on their demographic and socioeconomic or even perception, attitude and level of knowledge. So let's look closely on group B and C. The group B, we don't know whether their compliance is due to the peer pressure or maybe some store level or work level mandates. It's not by the government mandate, but maybe their job site mandate. But what's clear is that they are complying despite their opposition to the regulation, suggests that their comply compliance may continue. Right, uh, unless there's a big change on their um, maybe uh, certain situation in their town or in their job. And when you look at the, uh, I'm going to show you more details in the later slide, but their dem demographics and characteristics uh, is pretty stand out, very uh, interesting way. So, but we can call them as more like rural compliers. They're, they're more like sort of the uh, educated and um, they see some benefit of complying the, the rules or regulation, even if they don't believe. That's the group B. And group C, non-compliant believers, and and uh, kind of kind of opposite, they are distinctly younger and politically disengaged. So we don't know whether they are really waiting for a more strong or definitive mandates, or simply feel uncomfortable complying the rule when others around them not complying the rule. So in this group, I think the local level, state level, even national level mandates and coupled with the appropriate messaging strategy may bring them into compliance. That's the sort of message or, or implication from these two groups. So I'll show you some of our uh, the result. So I don't want to go into all the details, but you can see that the, the these four groups uh, stand out on many different variables. For example, like the political characteristics, very clear. Look at the 71% uh, within group A are planning to vote for Joe Biden. This, is, this survey was uh, occurred before the actual election but compared to only less than 6% and on group D and, and planning for vote for Biden. But also based on their income and their experiences and health condition, uh, family status, yeah, it, it indicate that this grouping works pretty well in terms of understanding the what's behind their choices. So this graph, uh, sort of coincide with the other findings from other papers. This is a clear distinction across the group. So when they are, uh, belong to group A or C, they're more likely to be liberal or very liberal. But if they belong to group B and D, and uh, they're politically more conservative or very conservative. So at least in the political lens, Group A and C go together, and while group B and D go together. But as I mentioned, the, this political um, sort of the simplistic lens will not be able to help us to really understand what's going on, on particularly on group B and D. So some 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 of the important finding from the tables and graph. So believers and defiers differ strikingly by gender and, and their political um, sort of the support for a, the presidential candidates. Also the health insurance status and also their acquaintance with people um, hospitalized with COVID-19. So group A and D, the disagree, almost everything. But uh, more profoundly over whether face mask help reduce COVID-19. So this is more like a, their perception and knowledge. So 93% of group A believe the face mask help reduce COVID-19, but only 20% believe the effects of effectiveness of the COVID-19, uh, the face mask reducing COVID-19 cases. Um, now look at the group B and C. So group B are 
relatively more white, more older, and the more richer and more Protestants and not planning for Biden. However, uh, among this group, 52% agree face masks help reduce COVID-19. So that's partly related to why this group B becomes a compliant disbelievers. But group C, non-compliant disbelievers are least likely to have a college education, more likely to be spending younger, um, having young children is really important, right? And also has been laid off because of the pandemic, less likely to vote and more unsure of the who they vote for. But their um, sort of level of knowledge on, on face mask is even higher. So 61% agree that face mask help reduce COVID-19. I know it's my time is so almost up. So, so we actually ran a multinomial logic regression model and the almost every variable came out significant, but we really focused on the knowledge question. So we actually had a nine knowledge question on COVID-19, including the face masks. So face mask variable stand out and very strongly and that really uh, is a big driver of their choices on on the mask wearing and also their support for a mask mandate. Yeah, this graph actually web graph really show clearly and what which of these knowledge question uh, more influential. The mask mask question is the, the top and also the uh, some misperception about young Others are immune and cannot be infected. Those are sent out. Um, but most of the other questions are also related somewhat to classify these groups. OK, so um, I think I can skip here. Anyway, clearly group B and C are really stand out and compared to group uh, A and D. So um, but the simplistic classification, we actually simply understand group A and C together and group B and D together, but that's not true. That's not helping. And we need to really look at, look at the more detail about how group B is different from group D and how group C is different from group A. OK, finally, the discussion. What do we learn from this? Um, the, such a dichotomy kind of understanding about their mask wearing is misleading, could be misleading because some people who oppose mask regulation actually do wear masks, but some who support regulation don't wear face masks. So as mentioned, the 13% may not be achievable even uh, with uh, very strong mandates. I don't know how to really um, overcome that, that hurdle. But at least we can try our best to reach out to 87%, about 90% goal uh, based on the understanding of this data. And what we can do for group B and C, we really try to uh, devise a strategy more efficiently and more evidence-based. And the messaging strategy will, should be more uh, astute and energetic and try to in, uh, enhance the level of enforcements or provide more more specific and detailed, a more user friendly way of delivering the information to improve their their knowledge level. OK, and this is not the end of the work and we actually uh, have the about three paper ideas in mind using this data. So another way of the improving our study is to uh, have a further classification, not, on, not only on four, but we can actually have eight groups. And this is a kind of sketch, out, sketch of the, uh, the eight group classification. Now, uh, in, in my last minute, I want to discuss about more pro level because the mask is only one piece of the what government can do or what we can do. So it's clear that US policy failed compared to the other countries, it's clear, but we really need to uh, learn from the past failure and to do a better job. This is a never ending sort of challenge or even competition, global competition. So I just want to use some of the, the good lesson from South Korea, uh, which now currently has a little 
a uh, little problem, but compared to like 200,000 cases per day, but South Korea only 500 cases. So, but they already had a very uh, strict kind of social distancing and lockdown kind of policy already. So, um, if you look at the here in why US failed, um, sort of very optimistic, sort of the excessively optimistic because of the past successes, like they were handled pretty well in Ebola or SARS or other previous pandemic pretty well. So probably too much uh, optimistic and slow, passive, insufficient testing and very non-transparent and some misguiding guideline. So it really lose a lot of public trust and lack of compliance in social distancing and mask wearing. So it needs to be really a combination of all these things to really learn from the past failure. OK, I think that's it. So uh, before we get into the Q&A session, I really wish you a happy mask or Zoom holiday. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dr. Kim. We certainly have, as, as you anticipated, lots of questions. Uh, I'm going to combine two to start us off. So someone in the audience has asked about kind of this cultural influence on whether or not to wear a mask. Uh, in general, and then another one asked specifically, um, you know, why do you think, you know, what's going on with Korea and the U.S. in particular? So, yeah, certainly culture is a big driver, as I mentioned. So, um, I, I think that the many of the Asian countries have less stigma on uh, wearing a face mask, and also the their uh, their air pollution situation recently um, already forced them to wear a mask in specific season. Like for example, in the winter season and spring season, they they have already worn a mask and almost all the time when they go outside. Even if they they are healthy, they wear a mask because of a lot of the kind of the flu season. They try to protect themselves, and then no one view the people with a mask and uh, with any any different kind of um, sort of the concerns or or so for example the I know in in sort of the Western culture people wearing masks has probably something to try to hide or maybe some kind of the like ethical or moral or or some kind of issue with the wearing mask right because this is more like the cultural aspects of showing their faces and to be more transparent to, to people they come across. So probably I may not the best person to talk about so American cultures on why the America really stick to to not wear masks, but uh, and it's according to the, to the literature and this cultural connotation of the mask wearing in the Western Hemisphere is a is a big driver. Of course, the politics is a key uh, as well. Because the I don't know like when it starts the combining the mask with the political connotation, but sort of the some literature mentioned that um, the mask is kind of give a message that I'm weak, I'm I'm kind of not really healthy, and I'm, I'm not strong. So more like a manly kind of the message or signal to others. You know, to quote, um, there's a physician in, in rural Texas who, who recently contracted COVID and there's not a lot of mask compliance out there. And he said, you know, out here, robbers, bank robbers wear masks um, as opposed to, as you're right, you know, when I was in Taiwan, it seems like a lifetime ago, you know, just over a year ago, everyone wore masks in in public transportation it was it and I, I will admit it was a bit jarring at that point I thought why is everyone wearing a mask I mean it's a heavily densely populated area um, but you can see their their infection rates have stayed pretty flat while ours spikes so clearly there's something going on um, so another great question from the audience um, you know, so with the changing guidelines of CDC, as you mentioned earlier, from March saying, you know, don't wear a mask to now where there's 
you know, very robust encouragement to to wear masks in, in most situations. You know, how how does the changing guidance on that affect affect compliance, do you think, or undermines that trust? Yeah, there's a whole purpose of, purpose of doing this, uh, this research because um, we thought that the, the, the two most reasons why people wear a mask include the self-awareness of the risk or self kind of the belief about the effectiveness of mask. So then the governmental enforcement is not even necessary, like like yeah. like in um, East Asia. They they just simply wear a mask, even if government say uh, you don't need to wear a mask, they still wear a mask because they are aware of the, the risk or they 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 believe the effectiveness of the mask. But some people um, simply follow the rule by the governments, no matter they, whether they like or not. So um, like in my example episode and um, I know there may be some people feel uncomfortable wearing a mask like over an hour or so. So this is uh, when they see no benefit of wearing mask and they probably don't want to take that discomforts, right? So uh, in, in such case, I think governmental, governmental mandates uh, can be a key, right? So that's why back then in March and February um, when CDC and WHO say that, oh, you don't need to wear a mask as long as you're healthy. And if you wear a mask unnecessarily, then it will be a lack of the shortage of the mask for people who need like, like the medical doctors and nurses. So this is totally bad um, sort of suggestion from like the, the most authoritative, more and more scientific committee, WHO and CDC, they are basically wrong. So I think this time they need to do a lot better job and delivering the clear message and why ma mask is important. And then and I think they really need to confess this is what we like did and like a bad decision and then create a sort of endless um, sort of influence, bad influence on the, the current pandemic. But now they need to rectify their bad decision and then try to deliver the more clear message why mask is more important. Well, I think among our attendees, we have a distribution of people in your groups A, B, C, and D. So here's, I'm going to read one question verbatim. So why are socialists more likely to promote social distancing and emphasize the horrors of COVID-19? It's not like capitalists are anti-health, but it seems that these medical mandates are heavily politicized. Why, why is it this way? How would you respond to that question comment? I think the so so what's interesting in in, in this paper um, is the sort of that the, the Trump variable is like heavily dominating in in our model. So actually, we were trying to get out of, of those Trump effects uh, and to see whether whether the the other variables still stand out. So that's actually what I I, I showed you, but. Back to that question, I think the this uh, the current political environments or sort of highly excessively bipolarized political environments um, may be something that we can uh, understand that that situation. So it's not just like simply socialistic people or capitalistic people the wear a mask or don't like to wear a mask, but I think this is more like the politicians in, in current environment try to utilize the um, this mask wearing or science into their political campaign or agenda. So this is this is certainly misguided to some way. You know this it, it's I'm thinking too, and, and you'll have to tell me since this is your area, but when we think of people who don't take vaccines, right, it's it's not a clear overlap of politics or ideology and, and rejection of, of vaccines or resistance, right? I mean, there's parts of, you know, as, as people say, ah, there's no more liberal place than San Francisco, and that's where they've had these crazy outbreaks of things like measles and, uh, and and other diseases that there are vaccines for. So I guess my question is, how do we how do we move beyond this? It's not always aligned on political uh, 
ideology matched up on that. And there's always a tradition of anti-maskers. There were anti-maskers during the Spanish flu. So what's kind of the best way forward, I guess, to get more compliance and get us to that magic number where, you know, as, as I just read, they say if we get 90% mask uh, compliance, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll save $1 trillion in losses to the economy, or it might even be more than that. I mean, it clearly will have an impact. So, so how do we how do we get to that number of higher compliance in this challenging environment, both anti-mask and anti-vaccine? So, um, I think, in my opinion, I mean, someone probably in 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 this uh, meeting may uh, may not agree uh, with me, but I think the there are two challenges here: cultural barriers and the the political barriers. Um, which one is easy to overcome? I think the cultural barriers may be easier and it's in this environment. So like vaccination, for example, I know uh, even beyond their political affiliation or, or belief, some people simply don't like sort of the Western medicine or some sort of artificial medicine to tr try to protect. They kind of always try to uh, sort of the have their own own Behavior. So you know, they have a kind of strong preference based on their culture. Maybe some maybe just inherited to in their families or in their town. But I uh, I know that the even back in Spanish flu time and at the time the people initially didn't ha didn't have didn't wear a mask because of the cultural aspects. But after a, a couple of years, everyone wear a mask. So. I think culture could change. Uh, it takes time, but culture uh, can change. So even in this kind of really highly connected society, now we are looking at the people in East Asia wearing masks, and this is probably fine. So whenever they exposed to this kind of culture, this is this is not uh, not bad, or there's no stigma on wearing a mask. It just all depends on the situation. So I think if this is only related to the cultural aspects the anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers, I think they, they may change when they see the larger benefit of the wearing masks and compared to the, the cost of changing their sort of the trust or belief or culture. But as long as they're related to the political aspect, it's more, I think, complex. And that's, that's my finding or feelings because politicians can always try to utilize the highly contentious sort of the um, kind of opinions about a something. So this is, if this is not about science, it's not about culture, but about more politics, then it may be more difficult. But I think the, the analogy or the similarity between masks and the vaccines is similar, but, but also somewhat dif different because vaccines more, I think, protecting themselves Mostly, of course, if you're vaccinated, then your people around you may be more safer, but not as big as the mask. Mask is clearly protecting themselves as well as others, and also is visible, right? So if you wear a mask and people can see that you wear a mask, vaccination, you don't know. You cannot really ask anybody in Walmart and are you vaccinated? You cannot ask that, right? So maybe somewhat similar but a little difference in terms of the culture. Yeah, I mean when I was driving back from Stephenville when I had to get my computer fixed and I stopped at an HEB uh, just outside of it, people looked at me like I was some sort of alien because I was wearing a mask um, and it was almost the person, I mean this was early on as well, I think this was this was in April or something, or, or no, it was a little later than that. But anyway, it may have changed now, but certainly it varies by geography. And, and that's a point that one of our first questions came through. I mean, do we have, do we have to have different strategies to get people to comply for different demographics or different regions? Or kind of combining this with a question from Dr. Scotch, has anyone used an experimental or comparative approach to see how different styles of messaging might influence compliance in different settings? So in this, uh, I, am seeing, I haven't seen any published paper about devising the strategy of delivering the message on face mask yet. I'm sure that some group are working on it, but um, 
there are, there are some global competitive studies about what kind of policies has been made in terms of the mandating the masks and then uh, how they differ at the local level. But yeah, I think that's a definitely topic of my next paper and then how we can sort of the, the develop the strategy in based on the different kind of the characteristics of the people or different uh, characteristics of a region, right? For example, like clearly urban area and rural area, you, they may have a different strategy and and the maybe not just strong like uh, enforcements of the complying face mask in the rural area, they, they may be more uh, related to um, sort of the providing the information and or maybe some alternatives. The, the in rural area they may not have a lot of alternatives compared to the urban area, right? So they simply just uh, don't need to wear a mask because of their lifestyle. So uh, yeah, something like that. But um, yeah, I do not have a clear uh, answer to to that yet. Well, here's a a more technical question, but um, you know why are masks that prevent paint, smoke, pesticides, mining? other impacts more protective than a piece of cloth that's supposed to protect us from, quote, the deadliest virus in history, unquote. So I guess the different, there, there is a lot of skepticism, right, about even the efficacy of a homemade mask. Uh, you know, and I have a variety of masks here and I feel more confident in some than others, but I guess, you know, what, how do we, how do we get how do we answer the question of this, like a cloth mask and questions of effic efficacy? Yeah, but but that, that there are a lot of papers out there in terms of the efficacy by the different type of mask. I, I can actually share um, uh, with uh, uh, a few papers that I've, I've seen. So that's clear. That's a science. That's the area of science. So cloth mask is 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 um, okay but not as good as like um, sort of the, the more scientific masks like for example I think the East Asian people are really good at like uh, sort of the choosing the face mask not because of COVID but because of the the pollution so you know the particular matter like particular matter in PM10 and PM2.5 and these days even PM1 so since those pollutions are so heavy and so uh, serious, so people like try to really do some self experimentation. Like for example, in one day they wear like like uh, KF49, and then they still feel uncomfortable, and then had a lot of the the particles in in their in their nose and in their in their mouths or even kind of their their bodies, and they feel that oh this is not enough, and they're really looking for a better and better mask. I think something similar to COVID-19, and I think there was study about comparing like five different types of masks, dental masks, and this like the specific the part the PM pollution masks, and then the cloth mask, and also face covering like some plastic kind of covering, and plastic covering is bad. It's, a, it's, a, it's not really protective. So yeah, this is more like area of science. So. Of course, the, there's still policy discussion. So how we can really make sure that people wear a correct mask? That's more like policy aspects, but yeah, the science is clear. So there is a specific type of mask can be protective, not others. Yeah, it's it's very frustrating to be out and about and see people with a mask and their nose is hanging out, right? I mean, yeah. that, that, that doesn't do you any good. Um, well, here, here's a fun question that we got. How have mask mandates affected improvements in technology or or affected facial recognition technology? So uh, the 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 observer says, you know, in China, where we have a lot of of facial recognition technology out there, how how has have these technologies have had to adapt to universal mask use? for identification a, purposes or tracking. That is really, yeah, really interesting question and really uh, important question, I, I, I'll say. I always, whenever I have a chance to talk about the sort of technology-driven policy enforcement, so we do have the, a lot of technology already out there. So face recognition, even the sound recognition, for example, 
if if there are 10 people and somebody coughing and even current technology can detect who's coughing because of COVID-19. Oh, wow. So the technology is out there, but the problem is, uh, and typically in, in, in the United States, so because of the, the, the privacy issue, freedom issues, all kind of the personal information issues that people do not really willing to share their data or share their personal information with the technology. So it's very difficult to do, do that. Now, for example, contact tracing. Contact tracing, I think, is even more important than mask wearing in terms of the policy perspective. But contact tracing, the technology is already out there, like Apple and Google already um, so proposed to the government and we we can keep track of the everyone like who's infected and like for example their technology will really tell you within your certain boundary of your your location then it technology will tell you who are infected like how many like among 30 people there are two people within your boundary are positive but that could be possible only if they are willing to share their personal information when they are like positive infected, then they need to share, but that's not even possible. So back to your question, the technology is already out there. I think it's all about sort of changing the attitude or perception about about sort of the that risk risk trade off. How much personal information are you willing to sacrifice to promote the pers uh, the public safety or or public health risk? This is really risk risk trade off, but it's, it's a lot better enforced in China or, or, or South Korea compared to the United States. They're, they're, of course, they are pretty good in, in the face recognition, all kind of different technology, but we do have here as well, but we cannot simply not uh, implement those because of this, all these privacy and freedom issues. Yeah, and you know, I admit I wouldn't want to have the government track me on my phone, right? I mean, that's, I, Google tracks me on my phone. I mean, there's a lot of tracking commercially that I think people are uncomfortable with if, if they would know that, but there's, you're right, there's definitely going to be some resistance to that. I mean, I, I was thinking back to one of your first slides where you look at uh, mass compliance, say in the United, United Kingdom, Canada, US, is very much lower on average than than East Asia. So I think that cultural component is certainly there, but uh, your your observation on pollution as well, I think is is um, pretty impressive. Well, I we have gone past time. Um, one one question I didn't get to that I it's not necessarily related to masks, but I, I want to ask it just just to to honor all the questions but there was one discussion you know any correlation between job type and disease spread also there are a lot of a lot of the the paper out there like sort of the essential workers their mobility pattern hasn't hasn't declined a lot because of their work type so the uh depending on the work type they cannot wear a mask right that's for sure right so that there are a bunch of papers already out there uh, depending on the job type. So job type, politics, and the, their personal experiences and always uh, stand out significance in, in terms of the mask wearing. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I will also uh, thank Doug Kyle who, who posted a, a, a citation for comparative work on messaging in, in this regard in the chat. So this has been a, a wonderful event. We had very good attendance. In fact, we would not have all fit in one of our conference rooms. So that's always a, a good sign for us. So thank you so much for, for sharing your insights with us. I look forward to seeing this in print. And I really appreciate our, our audience for joining us today. You know, people are grading, there's finals, there's a lot going on, but this is a really compelling and important topic. So stay safe, everyone, uh, mask up, I guess one last question for Dr. Kim, what kind of mask do you wear? I wear the older mask coming from my parents and parents-in-law, uh, uh, which is has been proven to protect and very, very small particles. So hopefully that's also good for COVID-19. 
<laughs> Very good. Well, we'll we'll leave it on that. All right. Again, thank you for joining us all. This has been a great talk. And if you know somebody who missed it and would like to watch it, this will be in our YouTube channel shortly. So thank you again. Stay safe and study hard. Thank you. All right. Take care.